Hey there, All Tricks fans. How you doing today? We have had kind of a comedy of errors the last couple of days. I have been battling the Wi-Fi signal in this new uh, beautiful studio, which is totally barren behind me. There's no character to it other than Miss Marlene Myers' Mastering Tableau book back there. That's my only prop in the Amazon box it came in. Anyway, long story short, after wrestling with my Wi-Fi a little bit and getting all of the technical stuff worked out, we're finally good. I've got a strong signal going in 1080 here. Hopefully it works out. Video, audio, everything kind of comes together and we can really start making some magic happen. As a result of all of the shenanigans, we're now a day behind. It is, as I'm recording, it is the 8th. This will publish on the 9th. This video is for days 8 and 9. So I'm a little behind if anybody's just following me with rapt attention, which I doubt. I know people are kind of on their own schedules. But if anybody's following me closely, we're still ahead of schedule that I posted originally, that 30-day schedule where we had four days per study section. We did two days on the first one, two days on the second one. This is section three now, and we're only coming up on day, day nine it's going to publish. We are still in great shape. We are still definitely going to get all of these tests finished in 30 days, and that's even if you don't have the Sparked license. So let's recap. We have done two segments already. Last show, which was two days ago now, we came out with Weekly Challenge 164. That tied all of the data prep stuff together that we've learned. We incorporated, I believe, the Summarize tool in that one. We are going to learn four more tools today, and we are going to start branching out into different palettes. So far, it's been all data input and data preparation. Today, we're going to get into parts. We're going to get into joining, and really, these are where Alteryx gets kind of cool. And you can just replace whole swaths of things that you were doing in other platforms. You're not going to be an Excel head no more. Sorry, Matt Bratton. Just a thing. I keep trying to convince Matt to come try Alteryx. And I think when he does, he's going to be hooked. All right. So today, four tools uh, on the docket. Let's go ahead and share screen. And we'll talk about what we're doing. That is designer. We will get there. Okay. So I clicked into the practice exercise. You can see I've been clicking around. When you open this up, all of these icons are going to be red. Let's talk about what this section is all about and how long you can expect this to take you. Because once again, we're truncating this, what was planned to be a four day jaunt through this section. We're gonna cut it down to two days. There's just not enough stuff there to keep us busy. We're gonna cut it down to two days and we're gonna get straight into testing. We're gonna be ready as soon as we're done with this segment to take our first test. And as you can see down here, that is the foundational micro-credential. Very exciting. We'll talk about that at the end of the episode. But let's get into what exactly we're working on here today. I just keep looking up in the corner to see if my Wi-Fi unsteady signal comes back on. I think it's good. I think it's good. The first thing you're going to click on are these foundational articles. These are short blog entries written by Ultrix people. I'll, I'll just show you the one. It's not lengthy. Alan Jacobson, a chief technology officer, I believe. But yeah, short blog entry should take each one. It should take you like five minutes to read each one. I've heard Alan give this talk. It's a very good talk, probably a very good blog entry, but just talking about the single source of truth and that, that kind of myth of, you know, can we get to the single source of truth? Is there any such thing? And, and things like that. The other blog entry, very similar. It's describing contextually what's the space in which we're doing these data manipulations in Alteryx. So useful stuff, not, not probably going to help you pass the test, really, but, uh, but good, good things to read. So let's go ahead and budget 10 minutes for blog reading. Then the bulk of the learning work is going to be in this video. 
It is called Data Basics. Database X. Get it. All right. They estimate 32 minutes. Let's just go ahead and give that a little buffer. Let's say it's going to be 35 to 40 minutes to watch these videos. Little knowledge check, quiz. You know that always takes a little bit longer than whatever the real-to-real -real time is that they publish. All right. All of that you can do on your own. That's probably good to get you launched into the tools on the first day. If you're going exactly according to the calendar, day eight is today. It is Friday as I'm recording this. You won't see it till Saturday. Schedule it how you like. It's really not a ton of work. Let's get into text to column tools, separating data into columns and rows. The text to columns tool, you may be very familiar with the concept from Excel. You're just breaking out truncated text according to some sort of delimiter into columns. Now you can, with TTC, you can also break it into rows. We're not really gonna play with that much. Let's go ahead, let me back that screen off. And let's, I've already loaded up the try it exercise. So let's go ahead and do that. Looking at the first one, it says create a separate column for address, city, state, and zip. And we can see that we have the address data and we've got commas in there. So we've got state address, comma, city, comma, state, looks like another comma, and then the zip. All right. And then looking at our target, we just wanna parse all those out. So just separate on the commas and we're gonna make four columns, it looks like. Now your text to columns tool is in your standard favorites menu or you can go into the parse. You ever get weirded out when you get those phone calls and you're like, I know this is a spam call, but they've rigged it so that it has some realistic looking name come up. Yeah, it's got a call from Chico Motley. I don't know what Chico Motley. Text to columns, let's hang it on there. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. All right, so it's gonna ask you which column to split. Let's go address, delimiter is a comma split to columns, and we want four. If you're kind of looking at a string of data and it's sort of blowing your mind, it's, you know, there's commas or there's hyphens or delimiters everywhere, just go ahead and always give yourself a couple of extra columns because it's better to have null columns and then dial them back than it is to have truncated values or, or have leave extra in the last column. It's harder to see. Let's go ahead and run that. Control R, happy noise. Happy analyst. Ooh, we got nulls. What did we do wrong? Oh, it stayed on customer ID. Why did it not switch to address? That's silly. I swear I switched it to address. Maybe when I roll the tape, I'll have had a brain fart. And there we go. You can see that. You can see down in the results pane that we've got street address, city, state, and zip. And if we wanted to move further with this, we're not going to, but if we wanted to move further with this, we could definitely uh, hang some better names on there than address one, two, three, and four. But that's a great success. Create a separate column for address, city, state, and zip. Keep state and zip together in the parse. All right. So really all we've got to do is just bank on that leave extra in last column. So we're going to do the exact same thing, address, comma, split to columns, and just make it three columns. It's going to process them from left to right. So it's going to give us the, the street address in the first column. It's going to give us the city in the second column, and then it's going to run out of space. So it's, all it's got left is a third column. So everything that's left has to go in that third column. At least that's the plan. Let's see if it works. Biggity bam. So we've got address three with state and zip. And does that look like the target? Indeed it does. Flawless victory. What's this one look like? Parse out the name field. Okay, so we've got a bunch of people here. First and last name. Nobody's got a middle name on us. Nobody's got a multi last name. Just first space last easy day. Pull down the text to columns tool. 
let's parse the name field. Now, special characters, you don't just want to type a space into the delimiter field. So you're going to go backslash s, and that is our special character for the space. We only need two columns for that, and let's run. Bada bing. There we go, first name, last name. Again, if we were proceeding on, well, probably the first thing we do is rename those columns, maybe get rid of the old field because we don't need it anymore. But that's all good. Okay. Create a separate column for address, city, state, and do not keep the zip. All right. So we're going to do pretty much like we did in the last one, except for one thing. So address, comma for the delimiter, number of columns, we're going to say three, extra characters, Let's give ourselves a warning. We're going to drop extra with the warning. Let's see how that works out. So it's still going to delimit on that third comma, but it won't have a fourth column. So you see all the warnings. The value had too many parts to sit, fit the number of columns, so it chopped something off. And what it chopped off at that last comma, the zip code, and just dumped it. So the zip code is gone, and we have a nice clean street address, city, and state. Easy enough. And that is it. That is the text to columns try. It. Folks, if you got questions on text to columns, super easy tool to use. Go ahead and drop those in the comments and I will get to all of them. Nope, we don't need to save that. What's next? Let's back out from text to columns. Or let's just click down the menu. Removing duplicates, the unique tool. Sometimes I like to call it Unique. I don't know why. I mispronounce words on purpose. The special snowflake, the Unique. With this tool, the only thing you've got to configure is the columns that you want to Unique on. If it's one, you're going to get the first unique value. I didn't say it there. The first unique value for, uh, first unique instance of each value in that column and the associated data to the left and right. Every other instance of that value is going to get dropped or it's going to get sent out the duplicate anchor. Now the unique tool has two outputs. It's got unique and duplicate U and D. Let's try it. Here we go. Let's go ahead and run our workflow to start with. Just get the data flowing. It's almost like turning on a spigot, really. And then you haven't hit the trigger on the hose, but the water is flowing into the hose. I like my metaphors. What are we going to do? Set of states. So we have state right here. Unique set. It looks like there's only one state. So this is going to be interesting. It targets one row. So this is kind of how not to use the unique tool. All right. The unique tool is not habitually in your favorites palette. I recommend you add it. And the way you add it is you click the little star in the upper right. You're gonna to have to go find the unique tool in the preparation palette, or you can find it in the uh, search bar, but then you can't add it to favorites. Here, if you find it in the preparation palette, you see the little gray star, that means it's not a favorite. You click that thing, you're gonna to toggle the, the gold star on, now it's a favorite. If you go back to your favorites menu, unique is right there for you. Let's bring you down, special snowflake. Okay, so now we're gonna show how, an, a, in my opinion, improper use of the unique tool, we can see just by looking at the data that every person on this list, all 90 of them, are in the great state of Colorado. So if you unique on states, let's go ahead and do that now, and you run it, you're going to find that you're only going to get the first person on the list. Everyone else is going to register as a duplicate. So uniquing on state here is a really, really bad idea because this is a meaningless uh, exercise. You could have just selected the first row to get Pamela Wright of 2316 East 5th Avenue. Like that does nothing. Okay, let's try again. Create a unique set of cities. This is not gonna be much better because you can see you got a lot of Denver's, you got a lot of Aurora's, you got a lot of Littleton's. You've got a bunch of people from the, the major cities and suburbs of Denver but really no rhyme or reason to it. So this is going to give you a couple more rows, but go unique set of cities. And the verbiage here isn't great either because unique set of cities, well, it's not, is it? 
it's the first person that appears in the list from each of these cities. So Nele Mendiola isn't special because she shows up here. She's just the first person on the list from Arvada. Konstantin Vlasis, boy, they really went all out on creating these names, isn't special because he's on this list. He was just the first person on the list from Aurora. Do you get my drift? There's nothing, there's nothing special about these rows of data. You just, and if you just wanted a unique list of the cities, you should have used the summarize tool. Anyway, I digress. I'm arguing with the exercise now. All right, create a unique set of customer segments. Where are our customer segments? Okay, once again, not super meaningful, but this is the exercise. So let's unique it. Customer segment. Okay, this is the last simple one I'm gonna do. You, you get the drift. There's really nothing to this tool. Okay, next one's gonna get create a unique set of customer segments in each city. All right, so let's do multiple. Now, if you select multiple fields in the unique tool, so earlier we were just getting, we we're picking customer segment, you just get the first person on the list with, with that unique value of customer segment. When you combine two different elements, now you're gonna get the first instance of each unique combination of those two elements that occurs in the data set. Still, again, it's, this isn't a particularly good illustration of why you would use unique. 22 records are unique, 68 are duplicate, but, but they're not duplicate. It's just, there. unique is good for, if you think you have duplicates of employees in your organization, or you have duplicates of some, of some field that you expect to be perfectly granular, to check that. All right, create a unique set of customer segments in each store. I suppose that one might be bordering on useful. Customer segment, store number, let's run it. How many come out? Okay, 33 and 57 duplicates, but again, th these results are not meaningful. So I, yeah, not a fan of the, uh, of the examples here, but it does show you how to use the unique tool, so. Mission accomplished, I suppose. No, I don't want to save it. Okay. So let's exit that and let's get into the good stuff. Now we're blending and joining. All right. The union tool. We're taking rows, we're stacking them on top of rows. Think about what a nightmare that is in Excel or actually a lot of other programs that I can think of. And think about how many headaches you prevent by doing this in Alteryx and just aligning your columns in some sort of sensible fashion. Let's give this a try. This is gonna be a good one. Why did I go ahead and download that? That was silly. I already have it downloaded. Silly boy. All right. Union, try it. So now we're getting complicated. Let's run the data and pour some water into the hose or open the spigot. We are going to auto configure by name. Now, this is the default for the union tool, but you need to look at your data and check it out and see if it's appropriate. Here we've got our first input, stream number, ID, first name, and last name. What is our second input? Stream number, last name, first name, ID. Perfect example of you wanna configure by name. Your names are exactly the same, so you're not gonna get any new columns or nulls or anything misaligned but they're out of position. So if you took this in Excel and control C, control V'd it together, you'd have a colossal mess and you'd probably just delete it and start over. And then you'd have to do the, the awful Excel cut and paste, like move columns around, which is just a nightmare. Let's avoid all that. Let's just union and alterix because that's what we're doing today. Okay, so this first one, auto config by name is the default option easy. When fields differ, they don't, but theoretically, if they did, I like to leave this on the default. Warning, continue processing all records, and we want to output all fields. Let's run it. Super simple. We didn't have to touch anything. All right. So we took four rows from number one, four rows from number two. As a result, we have eight rows. Stream number is the same, is similar data. 
ID, first name, last name, it all lined up perfectly. So that union tool reconfigured those columns to align them properly instead of doing the cut and paste dance. All right, now we're gonna to go to configure by position. Here we got stream number, ID, first name, last name, easy day. Now we've got field one, two, three, and four, okay? But if we look at it, we've got stream number, ID, first name, last name. This looks like a stream number, one, two, three, stream numbers. This is an ID, it's sequential. These are first names, these are last names. So the position of the columns is the same. So the we configure the union tool. That anchor right there means you can put multiple inputs in it. So that slate gray with the little fast forward symbol, multiple inputs. The green ones will only take one input in the anchor. Okay. So here we've got to change this from the default auto config by name. Nope, we want to go by position. When fields differ, warning continue processing, output all fields, all looks good. And what you're going to see is that second input, those field names, field one, two, three, and four, those are going to go away. And what you have is the good field names from that first input, stream number, ID, first name, last name. Easy day. What's next? Now we're going to manually configure. I like to call this plan Tetris because you're kind of nudging blocks in to line up with each other. Another union tool. One, two. We're not even going to look at the data this time. We're just going to throw caution to the wind. We're going to look at it in the manual configure interface. If you look here, you've got something similar to what we had last time. We have stream number ID, first name, and last name. We have field one, field two, field three, field four. If we look at them, okay, now we've got things misconfigured. Field three is the stream number. Field four is the ID. Two is first name, one is last name. Let's see if we can remember that. Three is stream, four is ID. We need to take field three and align it to the stream number. Four is the ID, align it to ID. Two is the first name, and one is the last name. Now let's run it. That was playing Tetris. Hope you enjoyed it. Not nearly as much fun as actual Tetris. I do miss that game. We should get a Game Boy. That'd be fun. All right, and what we find is stream number. Okay, we've got that single digit stream number. We've got an ID that looks appropriate. These are sequential numbers. There's obviously some things missing, 1, 2, 3, 4, 21, 22, 23, 24. And then these are all first names, these are all last names. Great success. Got a couple more. All right, now we've got to mess with other configurations. Let's go, we're just going to connect these in order. And it says auto configure by name, looking at the data, stream number ID, first name, last name. Stream number ID, first name, last name, gender. Now we've got an extra column. So it's saying what we want to do is ensure the data from the second data set is forced to the top resulting data set with the set specific output order option. You scroll all the way down to the bottom and you can see normally the input's just going to be number one, number two, however you connected them. Here we want to set a specific output order and we want input number two to go first. So this number two with the gender, we want that on top. That's gonna to cause some nulls in the other one. You can see the warning here, the field gender is not present in all inputs. That's what we set it on with the default. And you can see that the gender rows coming from input number two have been forced to the top. There are nulls below them because you don't have that gender column coming from input one. Happy day, we've succeeded. This last one says auto configure by name only output the common field subsets. What do we got this time? Stream, ID first, last, and gender. So we have the same inputs as last time, but this time we say, hey, we only want the fields that are shared between the two, so that gender field needs to be dropped. The auto configure by name is the automatic. When fields differ, warning continue processing records. And the second option, instead of output all fields, we want to output the common subset of fields the gender field will be dropped. 
still gives us the warning because that's how we set it. Field gender is not present in all inputs. And we can see in the output, there's no gender field there because we told it to drop it. Am I right? That is the union tool. It really doesn't get terribly complicated with the union tool, but it's very useful. It's used a lot in a workflow. You're going to split data streams. You're going to join them back together, and a union is a great way to do that if you are stacking rows on top of rows. Let's talk about the other scenario. Close this out. Don't need to save it. So union is done. Oh, come on now. I really did want that. Let's talk about joining data. So whereas union is top and bottom, joining is bringing it in left and right. If you have studied SQL, which I'm guessing most of you have at least a, a kind of preliminary level, this is like a SQL join. You are joining information in different fields with a common field subset, generally an ID or a name or something granular but that's what a join tool is going to do. And it actually uses some of the Venn diagrams and some of the terminology of SQL to get the point across. Last one, let's try the join. Let's look at our data first. Run it to get the water flowing. We have a first input. It's got customer ID, first, last, gender, and join date. And the second input has customer ID and first purchase date. You can see that we have a common field and that's customer ID. So we can conduct a join. You can also see that we have different information in the different databases and the different tables. So this is why we would want to conduct a join. We want that first purchase date joined to the other data. If you look closely at the join tool, it's got all sorts of stuff going on. You have a left input and a right input. Later for the advanced certificate, there is a tool called join multiple where you can bring a lot of different uh, inputs in. But with this join tool, you are restricted to two. When you get into the configuration of the join tool, now you got a lot going on in here. Join by record position, you don't want to mess with, at least now. We are going to join by specific fields and this is the, the SQL join. Now customer ID matches customer ID. They have the exact same name. So you click one and the other one populates because they have the same name. If you were joining two fields that had different names, but a common subset of the data, you would have to prescribe what right column you're selecting. The thing that you'll notice is you're gonna have a duplicate here. You can't have two customer ID columns in the output. And so it's going to rename the right customer ID as right customer ID. We don't need two columns saying the exact same thing, so you can deselect that right customer ID. Now coming out, you're going to have the values that join properly, which hopefully is all of them. They're going to come out the J anchor in the middle. Any values that don't join from either the left or right input are going to go out that corresponding output as unjoined rows. Let's see how it works. Good way to see the results is come down here in the results pane. Crazy enough, I know. Hit this top icon, which looks like a little pancake stack, and that is your messages. Five records were joined with one unjoined left and zero unjoined right. What that means is we had one customer that didn't match with our first purchase date database. If we look in the middle in the J anchor, we can see that five rows joined properly. They had obviously had the same customer ID. And we have taken this customer data and added the first purchase date field. Right, we got nothing. We knew that from the message. Left, there's one row. Galileo was not in our first purchase date field. So we can't join him to anything. All right, makes sense. This next one says join on first name and last name. Sometimes you're gonna have multiple fields that you join on. Let's go first name, let's go last name because we don't wanna join Joe Smith to Jennifer Smith. We don't wanna join people with the same last name that maybe don't have the same first name or Chris Hughes with Chris Bridges. So it's not gonna work out. 
deselect all resulting right fields. So the duplicate fields, we don't need to see the first name and last name twice, so we can get rid of those. Let's run it, see what happens. All right, message board, six records joined, zero unjoined left, and zero unjoined right. Awesome. Here's our six records. We've got all of our customers, first name, last name, and it's added their first purchase date. Okay. And the last one, we're going to configure by record position here. This one's kind of dumb. It's just if you have the exact same list of people or list of elements, data rows in two different inputs, you can join by record position if they're in the exact same order. With join by record position, you really don't have to do anything. You can deselect the duplicate fields, run it. Zero unjoined left, zero unjoined right, and in the middle, six joined, which we knew would happen because we had six left and six right. Did they join properly? Were they in the same order? Who knows? We didn't join on any common field. There was no ID here. We just first name, last name, first name, last name. I guess we knew they were in the same order, so they joined properly. But that's joining by record position. That just means row one here and row one here join, row two and row two join, row three and row three, so on and so forth, et cetera, et cetera. All right, a little, little joke for the musical theater folks out there. So that is it. Those are the four tools. Text to columns, unique, union, and join. That's what we learned for this section. Each of those, I expect, I mean, we probably took, what, five minutes per try it exercise. Each of them has an interactive lesson. Those are all estimated at five to six minutes. I rounded up a little bit. I said, hey, it's going to take you 15 minutes to get through each of these tools. So we'll factor that into the time estimation at the end. Let's go ahead and dig into the practice exercise. We have a practice exercise that's kind of going to combine all four of these elements with some of the other stuff we've learned, tie it all together, and we'll see a use case. Let's do that now. Practice exercise number two. I'm excited. What we are tasked to do is combine the customer transaction data in start 2.1, this input file here, and start 2.2, this other input file, got it, with the user details. Mm, that's ugly. The user details information is delimited by pipes, and boy is it ever. Alrighty. We take a look at the data. Start 2.1, we have customer ID, store number, customer segment, region, and annual transactions, five fields. Start 2.2, we have customer ID. Mm -hmm. Store number, customer segment, region, and annual transactions. All right. Now we need to join these together in some form. And they have the same field names. And we need to see if there are any duplicate users on the customer ID. So we have rows and we have rows. They have the same they have different IDs for the most part. We're not 100% sure on that yet, but they have different ID numbers. So we're stacking rows on top of rows. So the tool we need here is the union tool. Let's do it. Pull down a union. Let's unite the north and south. Rows upon rows upon rows. Our names are the same spelled the same and if they're not well we'll find out soon enough anyway and we can go back and fix it the union tool auto config by name that works we could also do position it really doesn't matter the names and positions are the same let's run it and see what comes out bing bing all right now we have 10 records we had five coming from 2.1 five coming from 2.2 combine them together stack them on top of each other and now we have 10. Everything looks aligned properly, great success. What do we need to do now? Ensure there are no duplicate users. Aha, we've learned a tool for that, the unique tool. 
Now, duplicate users, which field, when you look at this, which field should be perfectly granular? It is the customer ID field. Generally, an ID field is going to need to be perfectly granular in a database of customers or whatever that ID identifies. Now, if you have transactions listed, then you know you may have that customer ID listed for a bunch of different transactions. So hopefully, your customers come and buy from you pretty often. So that would be an example of a database where the customer ID is a supporting key or some some kind of non. Um, yeah, it's it's just some ID that is not supposed to be perfectly granular. But let's go ahead and unique on customer ID and see if we have anyone that's in the database twice. And indeed we do, because we only have nine records in the unique. Go to the duplicate, and Home Office South was in there twice, for shame. Okay, so we have nine unique values for that customer ID, that's good. I mean, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, I don't know, but at least we know accurately. So that's a positive. Now what do we need to do? We ensured there's no duplicate users. Combine those results with the user details. All right, so user details is a colossal mess. You can see that it's all smushed together. So in order to join that with anything, we're gonna have to run a text to columns right off the bat. Let's just kind of even things out here. And how many do we need? Well, we have a name, we have an ID number, we have a street address, we have a city, and we have a zip code. That's five. Field one is the only field we have. The delimiter is a pipe right next to the, the right shift key. The pipe delimiter. We need five columns to empty into. Leave the extra in the last column. I don't trust parsing tools, so let's run it. Parsing tools have, me and parsing tools do not mix. I've made many, many mistakes with both the text to columns tool and the uh, date time tool, which we'll learn later. Don't even get me started on regex. I, I taught a class on regex, still not good at it. Right. All right, so our text to columns has worked. We got names, we got IDs, we got streets, cities, and zip codes. Need up. You could go ahead and get fancy and rename those if you like, and I think it's that way. Eh, it's that way in the in the solution. So we're gonna we're gonna rename the things. All right. So the good thing about the select tool now we can drop that field one because we don't need it anymore. What is this? Name, address, city, zip. All right, we're going to drop the ID in the next. What's the ID called over here? Come ID. Okay. Come on, input. There we go. Here what we have is name. It entered a drop down. Customer underscore ID. Drop down again. Street. Or is that supposed to be address? Darn it. Address, city, and zip. Neato. What do we got left to do? The only tool that we haven't used yet, and that is join. Make sure that join left anchor connects to the unique anchor and the right one. Now we're going to join on. Customer ID, not store number, silly. Customer ID. I guess I did I spell it wrong? Looks like it matches. Weird, that should have automatically come up. Okay, all good. Definitely renamed it, so it's got the same name. Let's go ahead and deselect that duplicate field. And just for funsies, let's pull a browse tool down so we can get it. No kidding output, bada bing. And that looks like we've got nine fields, six records. They have nine fields, six records. Looks all the same to me. That's a victory. Now check your join tool because your messages say you got three unjoined left and four unjoined right. Let's just check them. 
couple of offices don't have corresponding user details and some user details don't match up with a home office. If your data, if this was an important data set and you really thought that all, they were all gonna match, that would definitely be something to check into. All right, that is the practice exercise. Let's go ahead and save it with some sort of identifier, not practice exercise two. I usually just tack my last name on. That is downloads, practice exercise to Bellamy. Now it is my own. Of course, it's not gonna let me post the picture because for some reason on this laptop, it doesn't like that. Works just fine on my work computer. Let's go turn in our homework. Submit your solution. Hmm. Let's just give them a little kudos there. Star this, give you a thumbs up and let's reply. Won't let us post the spoiler, so my laptop gets weird. So downloads or wherever you have it saved. Praxis exercise two, PE2 Bellamy. And there we go, it's attached. Let's post it. Let's do that HTML thing, a value for this field. Great practice. Did it not attach? Weird. Now it's posted. All right, now go to page 643 and see if it posted. Right there, major data. We got it. Okay, let's close that out. What is next, good people of Alteryx? The next thing is we're gonna test and we're gonna pass this test with flying colors. You, me, everybody. The foundational micro-credential is not an intimidating test. It is meant to be a stepping stone to the core micro-certificates. Let's not get weirded out about it. It's gonna be very easy. What I want you to do, your homework, this is gonna post on Saturday. I want us to test on Sunday. What I want you to do, oh, see, we've got the unstable Wi-Fi signal again. I'm like mentally willing it to improve. Let me see if I can change it. There may be a blip here. Actually, I have to edit this thing. Hmm. Okay. Well, hopefully this comes out. Uh, got a little stronger. Hopefully this comes out okay. I may have to go back and review this video and make sure that quality is up to my standards. And see this high quality video we're making here. All right. I'll put the pedal to the metal and we will wrap this up. We're at 45 minutes and that is plenty long enough. Prep guide, your homework for Sunday. Download this prep guide and take a look at it. Let's glance at it together. Here is our micro-credential exam prep guide. You'll see it's long on admin and short on details. That is by design. This is not a tough test. Exam overview, you're gonna get one hour. You should not need an hour to complete this test. You, you know these answers, trust me. It's 40 questions. You will breeze through most of them. It's going to ask you about basic data analytics. It's going to talk about data types and you know characteristics of quantitative versus qualitative data, types of data fields. I mean, this is all this is all just description. It's all just clickology and what what does the thing look like? The basics of Alteryx Designer is two thirds of it. 
interface elements, the, the template, the, or not the template, but the designer panes and all that. What do these tools do? You don't have to demonstrate any of it. You don't have to prac app any of it. It's just asking you questions about the tools. Okay. Steps to certification success. Interactive lessons, getting started learning path. We've done that. One to two weekly challenges. We've done two together. I don't even know why they recommend weekly challenges. There's no crack app on this test. And then take the exam. So here's my plan. Let's sum up what we did today. I estimate 35 minutes for Data Basics, the video. Let's add 10 for the article, so we're at 45. 15 minutes for each of the four seconds. So that's an hour total, an hour 45 total. And that practice, practice exercise, if you do it on your own, you don't follow along with me. You just go ahead, make your mistakes, have your fun. Let's call that 15 minutes. You're still at two hours max. Even if you did this just on Saturday, you could get through that in the 90 minutes that we've allotted for these exercises. So I think we're ready to do a quick study session and take that test on Sunday. Here is what I propose. I want to do a live study with me session on Sunday. If I can swing that, if I can get it approved by my better half, I will put that schedule out tomorrow. And that tomorrow, I mean Saturday. So I will publish this video Saturday morning, and I will put out the word that there's going to be a study with me session on Sunday, and we're down on the Wi-Fi again. Son of a bitch. Anyway. I will put the word out that we are doing a live session on Sunday. I will not use Wi-Fi to do it. Maybe I'll do it from my office so I know it's stable. This thing is maddening. And we will get together and study on Sunday, and we will get together and we will take that test. And then Monday morning, we're going to be ready to crush on. Now, we're going to take the general knowledge test on Monday. Maybe Monday we'll do another study session and we'll set Tuesday up for that test because we're, we're way ahead of schedule. But that's what my, my plan is. So get ready. I mean, we're studying, we're taking certs. Who here has not taken a test before and passed it? I guarantee all of you have done that before. So no matter how nervous you get about tests, don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. And even if you do fail it, you just got to wait a week to retake it. We can still move on with the rest of the training. Let me close that out. And there it is. Get certified, and we are going to click through there and take that test on Sunday. Mark my words. We will do it together. All right. Who's ready for a live session? Okay. So I will re-endeavor to solve my Wi-Fi hijinks. Hopefully this video was quality enough that you can see what's going on. Yeah. That's it. What's next? Take that test. So tell me, are you ready? Do you feel ready? Are you, are you intimidated by the test? It's very simple. So folks, if you got value out of this, if you like this video, go ahead and click like on the video, subscribe to the channel. If you wanna know when all of our videos come out, you can click the notification bell. And with that, I'm finished. This is day eight and nine. And folks, I tell you what, follow me and I'm going to make you a genuine Ultrix hero just like me.